The U.S. military has confirmed on Monday that an F-16 fighter jet was struck by enemy fire in eastern Afghanistan. It's rare that an advanced fighter jet is hit by a Taliban attack. Officials said the multi-million dollar jet has sustained significant damage. It was forced to jettison its fuel tanks and munitions before returning to base. The pilot was unharmed. The Taliban claimed on Twitter that they had downed the jet in eastern Paktia province last Tuesday evening. Most of the province is under its control. U.S. forces say the Taliban had shot down several military helicopters using small arms fire, but never an F-16. The jet is capable of supersonic speeds and reaching heights of 50,000 feet. The U.S. Air Force has lost control of two Predator drones in recent incidents in Turkey and in Iraq. The U.S. military officials said in the first case on October 16 that a Predator crew reported a lost link and a subsequent crash while the drone was flying southeast of the Iraqi capital Baghdad. The second UAV crashed on October 19 in southern Turkey. The cause of the crashes is under investigation. As President and Commander in Chief, my first and most res uh, important responsibility is keeping the American people safe. Uh, and that means that we make sure that our military is properly funded. The bill that's before me authorizing our uh, defense spending for this year uh, does a number of good things. It makes sure that uh, our military is funded. It has some important provisions around uh, reform of our military uh, retirement system, uh, which is necessary to make sure that it's stable uh, and effective. Uh, it's got some cybersecurity provisions that are necessary. That's an increasing threat. Uh, unfortunately, it falls woefully short in three areas. It keeps in place the sequester that is inadequate for us to properly fund our military in a stable, sustained way and allows uh, all of our armed forces to plan properly. Unfortunately, it prevents a wide range of reforms that are necessary for us to get our military modernized and uh, able to deal with the many threats that are presenting themselves in the 21st century. And the third thing is that uh, this legislation specifically impedes our ability to close Guantanamo in a way that I have repeatedly argued uh, is counterproductive to uh, our efforts to defeat uh, terrorism uh, around the world. Uh, I'm going to be vetoing uh, this authorization bill. I'm going to be sending it back to Congress, and my message to them is very simple. Uh, let's do this right. There you go. His reputation for ruthlessness is legendary, his military skill unquestioned, and he's now regularly being spotted on key battlegrounds in Syria. This picture from Iran's semi-official news agency showing Iranian General Qasem Soleimani seemingly posing with troops in Syria. The latest evidence of Iran's growing involvement with Russia there. Other photos posted on social media have captions which claim Soleimani was in western Syria in recent days, speaking not only to Syrian troops, but to fighters from Hezbollah, considered a terror group by the U.S. CNN cannot independently verify the authenticity of these photos or when they were taken. But if Soleimani is in western Syria, experts say it foreshadows danger. It would be another piece of evidence that the Iranians are planning to be heavily involved in what appears to be a planned major offensive in the area. U.S. officials tell CNN there could be more than 2,000 Iranian troops, up to 6,000 Syrians, and more than 2,000 Hezbollah fighters on the ground near Aleppo in an offensive aimed at recapturing that city from anti-Assad forces. It's a dangerous alliance that has Washington worried. It's quite significant. This has been an escalating trend we've seen over the past 
year in particular, as the regime's performance militarily has faltered, the Iranians have stepped in to fill that role and actually have established a strong political and military presence in the country. We have gotten to a stage where essentially these battles are being planned and led on the battlefield by Iranians. Soleimani leads the elite Quds force of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. He's a shadowy commander with a lot of American blood on his hands from the Iraq war. He uh, spearheaded the effort uh, to build bombs that uh, were very effective at killing American forces, these advanced explosive devices. U.S. officials say Soleimani was also involved in a notorious plot on American soil, overseeing Quds Force operatives who, in 2011, tried and failed to assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States at Washington's upscale Cafe Milano. Iran denies involvement. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said on Saturday that it's stupid for the U.S. to refuse to host a Russian delegation on Syria. In his words, Washington just demonstrated their weakness due to such a decision. A surprise from Moscow this morning where embattled Syrian President Bashar al-Assad made a brief visit. He met with Russian President Vladimir Putin, whose military is supporting Assad in the civil war in Syria. This was a lot more than a courtesy call. It was a thanks for everything, and I mean everything, call. With Vladimir Putin's jets effectively becoming Bashar al-Assad's air force, the beleaguered Syrian leader smiled like he hasn't smiled in years. The terrorism that is now spreading today could have, without your decisions and actions, spread to even more territories and states, not just in our region, but to other regions too. Two weeks into Russia's surprise military intervention in Syria in the air and on the ground, Mr. Putin promised Mr. Assad continued support. We are prepared to do whatever we can, not only in the course of military efforts to fight terrorism, but also in the course of the political process. That's a process the U.S. would like to see result in Assad's ouster. Today, U.S. officials wonder how the visit will affect upcoming meetings Friday between Secretary of State Kerry and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. The White House spokesman telling reporters, quote, We view the red carpet welcome for Assad, who has used chemical weapons against his own people, at odds with the stated goal by the Russians for a political transition in Syria. But Russia's recent military activities may not end in Syria. President Putin reportedly sending a letter to Iraqi Prime Minister al-Abadi expressing his support for the fight against ISIS on the Iraqi side of the border, raising the possibility of Russia filling a perceived void in Iraq left by the U.S. These people in Russia and the Kremlin are going to say, OK, we have an opportunity here. We're going to drive our version of a Mack truck right through this area, and we are going to control the agenda for the northern Middle East. And, and that is exactly what they're doing. The video was shot over the district of Jobar and is considered to be the first imagery that shows the scale of destruction from the air. Jobar is a part of the eastern suburb of Damascus known as the Eastern Gotha which has been held by rebels for years. Thousands of Syrian army airstrikes and barrel bombs have been dropped from army helicopters throughout the country's civil war. Most are in the central and northern parts of Syria, and some are in those eastern suburbs of Damascus. Artillery shells and airstrikes on Jobar shake Damascus practically on a daily basis. Russia has been conducting a military campaign as part of an agreement with Iran, Iraq, and Syria to help clear the Middle East of Daesh Takfiri terrorists. The Russian military action has proved effective, but the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs remains concerned about foreign support for the terrorists. The ministry says ending foreign support and financing for terrorists operating in Syria is now a top priority for Russia. We have information that terrorist groups continue to receive shipments of equipment and reinforcement from abroad. This is a very dangerous trend. It is clear that without such a support, victory of the terrorists could be achieved much faster.
Russian warplanes on the attack in Aleppo. The video cannot be independently verified, but Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country's show of force is sending a message to the world. As a result of the operation, it has been confirmed that Russia is ready to adequately and effectively respond to the terrorist threat and any other threats to our country. NATO has once again voiced concern over Russia's military involvement in Syria. NATO Deputy Secretary General Alexander Rushbaugh says since Moscow's objectives in Syria differ from those of the U.S. and its allies, his airstrikes in the Arab country creates the risk of, quote, an incident getting out of control. The Western alliance is angry at the Kremlin for targeting militants fighting against the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Moscow's airstrikes in Syria have further sustained its ties, strained its ties, rather, with NATO members. NATO is to launch a massive military exercise on land, sea, and air. The drills mark the biggest test of the alliance's capability since 2002, dubbed Trident Juncture. The drills will begin at an airbase in Sicily and will continue on Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese territory. The three-week live exercise follows a staff training program that began earlier this month. The exercise is to test out a 5,000-strong spearhead force that can deploy in less than a week. Nearly 36,000 soldiers and civilians from nearly 30 countries, including non-NATO member Ukraine, the European Union, and the African Union are expected to take part in the drills. NATO officials have rejected suggestions that the exercise is directed against Russia. Latvian and German troops took part in a joint military drill at the Adazi training field, Latvia, on Thursday. More than 280 soldiers carried out attack and defense trainings with the participation of German's infantry fighting vehicle, the Marder. Latvia currently hosts NATO forces from Germany and the United States. Russia, Latvia's neighbor, has previously condemned the NATO buildup on its western border. Russia plans to station a military unit in the Arctic by 2018. The country's defense minister told Russian media on Thursday that the unit should be up and running by then. He added that a military base with modern equipment has also been built on the Arctic island of Kotelny. Russia has reinforced its presence in the Arctic in recent years. The area is believed to hold huge oil reserves and natural gas deposits. In 2014, the country released its military doctrine, which prioritized the need to protect its interests in the Arctic. Russia also plans to create a network of naval facilities for submarines and warships in the Arctic by the end of the decade. Well, Iran's army is set to launch large-scale drills in western and northwestern regions. The drills are part of the army's annual exercises to boost military readiness. This drill uh, is about to happen in a day, and it's going to take as long as two days. Behind me, you see uh, the rapid reaction units and artillery units. Armored vehicles, they are all positioned, also, uh, also uh, helicopters that have came just now. Uh, they are in position and ready to perform the drill. It is a very major one and it is a joint one. So because we're going to see besiege forces, artillery ground forces, air supports, uh, using radar uh, missile systems and uh, also uh, all the other sorts of, sorts of armaments that are necessary in order to combat and counter proxy wars, they are already in position. And uh, the, the thing is, the aim of this uh, drill is uh, to, per, to increase the border security of our Exercises are really an important way to ensure that the plans to respond to terrorist threats along the China-India border areas are as good as they can be. After nearly two weeks of intense training, the troops are showing us what they are made of. China is hosting a joint military drill to highlight what it regards as a growing threat from terrorism and extremism. Today's mission is to crack down on a group of terrorists who have been hiding in the mountainous area without causing any casualties in the nearby villages. The rapid assault mission deployed tactics such as fast roping from cliffs and storming buildings to rescue hostages. A drill like this doesn't usually involve unexpected occurrences. Instead, what counts is how the two sides can improve their intelligence sharing and joint decision making. Two, three. Yeah. 
Continuons. Overall, it was a smooth operation, and it's not like the old story of a counter-terrorism crackdown. But considering the language barrier and the differences in real combat, essentially both sets of troops have exchanged their experiences and become more coordinated. China and India had held five joint military exercises in the past eight years, and they had signed a border defense cooperation agreement to expand confidence-building measures. It is a signal that military cooperation can greatly enhance bilateral relations. The Pakistan says it will not compromise on its stockpile of nuclear weapons. Pakistani officials say Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif will tell U.S. President Barack Obama that Islamabad will not accept limits on the use of small tactical nukes. The two leaders are set to meet at the White House later on Thursday. Pakistan insists that tactical weapons would deter a surprise attack by its nuclear rival India and that America's demand is unreasonable. But the U.S. is concerned that the smaller size of the bombs may make them more tempting to use in a conventional war. Washington is preparing to sell eight F-16 fighter jets to Islamabad as part of efforts to bolster bilateral ties. However, the offer seems not to be attractive enough to dissuade Pakistan. Japan has confirmed the first case of cancer linked to the Fukushima nuclear reactor leak more than four years after the disaster. The case has affected a former employee who had worked at a destroyed building housing one of Fukushima's crippled reactors. He had, won, he had worn protective equipment during more than a year spent at the plant. Now he's being diagnosed with leukemia. An official with Japan's health ministry says other possible causes have been ruled out. Three similar cases of cancer have been detected among Fukushima's workers, but their link to the accident has not been confirmed yet. Japan saw the largest nuclear disaster in a generation in 2011. This was caused by a powerful earthquake and tsunami that led to the release of radioactive material at the nuclear power plant. Carl Chappell's children were frolicking in the cold water creek beds of St. Louis, Missouri decades ago. He had no clue his kids were literally playing in poison. The time they were doing that, most of that contaminated material that was in there was up top. It would be decades before Carl and thousands of other families discovered that the 15-mile creek was flowing with lethal radioactive material. My son was diagnosed with appendix cancer in 2011. And that basically was the time that we started really putting everything together. Stories courageously shared by families on Facebook led the community to begin investigating. People started getting diagnosed with cancer before 40. And these were very active people, very healthy, um, very healthy people. It just didn't make sense. It all goes back to World War II when America tested its first nuclear weapons, otherwise known as the Manhattan Project. Radioactive waste was later on dumped near the creek, contaminating nearby farmland. 18 months ago, Mary Osco was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. She's never smoked a cigarette in her life. This was part of national defense. The Manhattan Project was to, to um, get the atomic bomb so that we could go over and you know, win the war and, and uh, defeat Japan and, and take out these cities. But we're still victims. We're still casualties of World War II. Nearly 2,000 cancer cases have been reported in neighborhoods around the creek. Among them, Angela Hebling's mother, who died of brain cancer at age 39. Her father has stage four throat cancer. And Angela herself has been deemed a medical anomaly by doctors. And I was diagnosed with pleomorphic adenoma. It's a, it's a tumor that's in your parotid gland. From my own research, I've discovered that that tumor is commonly seen in Hiroshima bomb victim survivors. In June, the Army Corps of Engineers announced that it found more radioactive soil in various areas, including this public park. Our main goal is to make sure that we can protect human health and the environment. And what we're dealing with is generally a low-level contamination, but it does pose a long-term threat, and that's what we stay focused on. So right now, if you walked over a spot that has contamination, chances are it's six inches to several feet underneath clean soil. For Carl Chappell's family, that long-term threat is very real. His father died of cancer at age 48, and just a few months ago, his son suffered the same fate at 44 years old. He did pretty well the first couple of years, but it was in, in uh, March of 2014 is when he really had gotten uh, sick and then it was beyond 
anything that they could really do for him. Uh, and then he passed away 86 days ago. The Army Corps of Engineers has spent 17 years excavating and cleaning up the poisons of Cold Water Creek. Yet so far, the U.S. government has done nothing to study the health consequences that this disaster has had on countless families. The hunt underway in St. Louis after several fires at churches there. Federal investigators now searching a three-mile area for clues into this mystery. Six fires in two weeks at six predominantly black churches. All of it not far from the community where Michael Brown, the unarmed black teenager, was shot by a white officer. Of course, that story has not faded from the headlines there. ABC's Alex Perez tonight. Tonight, investigators in St. Louis on the hunt, trying to figure out who is setting fires at churches. Original door was built in 1948. Reverend Roderick Burton says the damage to his church could cost more than $7,000 to repair the building's original 1948 doors charred. If someone is attacking that or stepping on that, Americans should come together in one voice and say, this is wrong. In the last two weeks, six churches, all within three miles of each other. The fires all set near an entrance, different denominations, but mostly black congregations. It is arson. It's, these are being intentionally set. It isn't spontaneous combustion, so they're not occurring on their own. This area, still recovering from the riots, is sparked after Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson shot and killed Michael Brown. Tonight, many in this community praying for the culprit and for an arrest. And David, you can see the flames is so hot, completely melting the siding on this church right here. ATF investigators believe the same person is responsible for all of these incidents. Tonight, there's a $2,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest. Real life horror at a zombie convention, ZombieCon. Gunfire erupting, killing one person and injuring at least five others. Police are still searching for the shooter this morning. And ABC's Ryan Smith is here with the story. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Robin. ZombieCon is a massive party of thousands, 10 years running now. But what was supposed to be a celebration of the living dead took a horrifying turn. Oh my God. This morning, police on the hunt for a killer leaving one dead, injuring at least five others, and sending hundreds of others running for their lives. The chaos happening late Saturday night at the annual ZombieCom Street Festival in Fort Myers, Florida. A massive party which attracts nearly 20,000 zombie lovers every year. But at 11.45 p.m., the event turned from spooky to tragic. Those gunshots sending throngs of revelers dressed like the living dead fleeing. Their costumes, some covered in fake blood, adding to the confusion. We kind of like ran and then we were like, wait, was that real? 20-year-old Expavius Tyrell Taylor, a local junior college football player, was killed in the shooting. Gunshot to the head. This man, one of several treated for gunshot wounds. I look down at my hand and there's a giant hole in it. Police now leaving no stone unturned, asking ZombieCom attendees to turn over pictures and cell phone videos, hoping for any clue to help track down those responsible. Authorities don't know if one or more people are responsible. They're reviewing surveillance videos from restaurants and shops to help find any suspects, but so far they haven't released a motive. Rob From what we know at this point, there was a reported dice game occurring in the outside courtyard by the Floyd building. Witnesses have told us that a fight began, an argument began, over that dice game. Uh, as the fight progressed, uh, persons were uh, fisticuffing each other, and suddenly shots were heard, shots were fired. There were a number of students who were walking by that area at the time this happened. Three students, three females, were passers-by, uh, innocent passers-by, who were hit by gunfire. Two of those females were taken to Vanderbilt University Medical Center for treatment. One did not need treatment. She had a very minor graze. The person deceased is a male we believe him to be, at this moment, a 19-year-old non-student. 
It is being called the strongest hurricane ever recorded, and now this potentially catastrophic storm is just hours away from making landfall in Mexico. Officials are evacuating more than 50,000 people ahead of Hurricane Patricia. Forecasters like Chad predict the storm will bring heavy rain, destructive waves, and landslides. So let's head to Chad Myers. Um, he's here to tell us more. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Carol. If you can think of a name, Camille, Andrew, Katrina, Rita, Wilma, this storm is stronger than every single one. The pressure is lower, the wind speed is higher. 200 miles per hour. This is an unprecedented hurricane uh, in terms of the strength of the storm. Well, what is really unusual about the storm is that it did undergo explosive intensification over the past 24 hours or so. And so it is now, I think, the strongest uh, storm in terms of the peak winds that the Hurricane Center has ever made a forecast for. And the other thing that's really interesting is that there was just a, you know, such a, an inability, such a failure on the part of the, the computer models to predict this ultimate intensity. Now, it's very hard for models to predict such an extreme event like this, but it's still breathtaking to see uh, a system like this and to see how much more we need to learn. Millions in waterlogged Texas face the threat of more severe weather. A violent storm system is moving across the central and western parts of the state. Flash flood watches are in effect for much of Texas. Omar Villafranca is in Dallas, which is bracing for up to seven inches of rain. Yikes. Omar, good morning. Good morning. Water is already starting to pool in low-lying areas like this one, and more rain is on the way. Forecasters warn that the flooding in this area could become dangerous. Overnight, pounding rain stung central and western Texas. A torrential downpour that dumped four inches in four hours in parts of the state. The dangerous, slow-moving storm system is flooding streets, leaving cars submerged and drivers stranded. Pretty much I was just driving and uh, I got stuck. GPSs don't know that uh, there's going to be waterlogged little areas. Double wide's floating. There goes double wide. Gone. In Rankin, floodwaters were strong enough to wash away this mobile home. No one was hurt. Drivers had their hands full in Abilene where another three inches of rain fell. Roads quickly turned into waterways, causing multiple accidents. The violent storm knocked out power for more than 2,000 people in Midland and swallowed up this ambulance in Odessa. There, flash floods prompted around 30 swift water rescues. According to an Adelaide University study, climate change will result in a complete food chain collapse across the world's oceans. The study reviewed more than 600 published studies on everything from coral reefs to kelp forests in the world's oceans. One professor stated there will be, quote, a species collapse from the top of the food chain down increased ocean acidification as well as warming and also pollution and overfishing is set to decrease the numbers and diversity of key species our ecosystems depend on. The study states that very few organisms will be able to adjust to the acidification and warmer waters except for microorganisms. Those could actually increase. But this won't help smaller fish, which means less food for bigger fish all resulting in that huge disruption of the food chain. Also, warmer water will lead to higher metabolic rates for marine life. Therefore, they'll need even more food to eat. With only a minority of marine life able to adapt to ocean changes, there will be a simplification of our oceans. This will have profound consequences on our food chain as well as our way of life. This study was a first of its kind and paints a grim picture of the future of our oceans glittering like an exotic gem in the distance. The entrance to the Svalbard seed vault extends out of the side of an Arctic mountain, looking more like a villain's lair from a James Bond movie than where humanity has banked the seeds of its survival. 
We walk into a long cement foreboding hallway. Safety helmets line the wall, protection against falling ice. So that's about 150 meters down into the mountain. This is becoming the permafrost here in granite. And down Michael there, Koch with the crop the trust that oversees the vault chamber. guides us deeper into the mountain. With each step, the temperature drops. It's like something out of a movie. It is like a holy place. Every time I come here, I feel like I'm in a cathedral. This is a place to pause and to think because it's a very unique place and it's a very important place for humanity. This is so beautiful and yet it's so simple. It's just a door, but behind it is the key to humanity's salvation. There are 860,000 types of seeds from all over the world here. So you get boxes from Germany, from Nigeria, from India, the United States, the largest gene bank in the world. That's an interesting box right here. Uh, this box comes from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the only wooden boxes in the vault. This is humanity's insurance policy, meant to safeguard against cataclysmic events that wipe out our crops. Despite multiple conflicts around the world, Koch says that's not what will bring about our demise. The agriculture is not adapting as fast currently as the climate is changing on us. We have to adapt to rising temperatures, to uh, wind and storm and flooding, new diseases and pests. We have salt water coming into the rice paddies in the fields, so salination is an issue. So these tolerances to these issues are found here. This is the di diversity of the genes that you're going to use to adapt agriculture. And you do not know what you're going to need 50 or 100 or 500 years from now. Even if power goes out, the vault can preserve these seeds for decades. In the race against climate change, protecting our past may be the only way to ensure our future. Now, one of the most terrifying figures in world history is back. He has been resurrected to appear on German screens this autumn. The political satire tells the story of Adolf Hitler returning to modern Germany and those behind the movie are mocking the character and envisage the dictator becoming popular again thanks to the internet. However, it seems Hitler doesn't need to rise from the dead to gain popularity. Businesses are already putting in the work. Now, this winemaker from Italy found himself in hot water after using Hitler's picture on his labels. He explained that he never wanted to glorify the Nazi leader, but to remind people his crimes should never be repeated. The businessman is not the only one provoking controversy for using Hitler's image. How is it appropriate to use Hitler on a billboard to advertise a wax museum or to advertise a herbal laxative tea? You can buy t-shirts featuring panda Hitlers and Teletubby Hitlers. Look, Thailand, you need to understand the only acceptable depictions of Hitler are either in a history textbook or accidentally on a dog's face. Now, these are some examples from India, where a cafe, a clothes shop, and even an ice cream are named after Hitler. And as we see in the following video promoting Nazi ideology has been taken up as a kind of joke by German teenagers. Director of the European Network Against Racism, Michel Prevot, says people close their eyes to the modern-day threat of Nazi ideology. What is really, uh, in a way, shocking is how people so easily uh, are taking this as an opportunity to air uh, xenophobic or anti-democratic sentiments. Many people, I would say the mainstream people, the men on the street, uh, are just like lost today in our societies where the, the, the guidelines that were before, like this is good, this is bad, are not there anymore. And they tend to slip very easily towards the, uh, the dark side of the force. If things were to start, a number of people that think they are decent, they are democratic, and they would never become racist to gain actually would very easily uh, slip in that direction. 
And at the same time, a scandal has sparked over football star Bastian Schweinsteiger, and he's now suing a Chinese toy maker for producing a doll dressed as a Nazi soldier, bearing a face that closely resembles the footballer. Now, the company says it's a pure coincidence that the toy soldier looks like Schweinsteiger. And however, some analysts have questioned why the media is more concerned about the footballer's face rather than the fact a child's toy is wearing a Nazi uniform. You said in June that the Palestinian Authority would be disbanded by the end of this year if there wasn't a two-state solution. Are you ever going to follow through on any of these threats or ultimatums? I mean, isn't it now the time to end this charade of a pretend Palestinian government in charge of a pretend Palestinian state which gives cover to an Israeli occupation? I said that Netanyahu's strategy is to make us a Palestinian authority without an authority, and he did that. He wants a cost-free occupation. And he wants to keep Gaza off the limits of the West Bank, and he's succeeding because he doesn't seek a two-state solution. He, t- he seeks one state, two systems, apartheid. We are an authority without an authority, and yes, if that, that is, I said that's not sustainable, and soon enough Netanyahu will find himself the only responsible you, between the River Jordan you and say the Mediterranean soon enough. because he's destroying the Palestinian Authority. I think he had destroyed the Palestinian Authority. You said authority. December. In June, I think you very said soon. December. I think very, very soon you're going to hear some decisions. Yes, I said December, this coming December. And Will you this disband December, the PA I hope this that December? The Palestine National Council, which is the highest parliament, the PA, the PA as, we, as was born to transfer Palestinians from occupation to independence, is being destroyed, finished by Netanyahu. Now we're not going to be an authority by name. Yes, if Netanyahu thinks he can sustain the status quo, we're telling him you're wrong and you're invited to assume your powers and, as the occupying power. <laughs> They call this female troll the Devil's Grandmother, also known as Slatten Pattern, a reference to her sagging breasts. The legend goes that they give men renewed energy. Another highlight is a 3D light show projected onto the side of a building in Axeltorf to tell the famous stories, including the legend of Flasdar. As the story goes, Flasdar could not bear the noise of the church bells. He set off with a sack of sand intending to bury the churches, unaware there was a hole in the bottom of the sack. The 10-kilometer ridge of Mogenstrup is said to have been created by the escaping sand he left in his wake. We did it. It was just a dream 12 years ago. Today, it's a reality. We're very grateful to all the people who made this possible, to the politicians who got to know our family. With Virginia and Catalina, our daughter, we've been a same-sex parental family for four years, with a lot of tenderness, so that fear disappears, so that society starts improving. This is our contribution. I do want to get married. I hope that one day I can step out of church holding my partner's hand. Civil union is a first step, but we, our generation, will be able to change Chile. Jesus himself gives this in verse 37 to 39. I'll just sort of quote it in a paraphrase. As it was in the days of Noah, 
so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Men and women eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and they had no idea that judgment was coming until it came and swept them all away. Indifference to God. Do you remember Genesis 6 when God said, I'm going to destroy mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth because all of his thoughts are evil all the time. And it was as though God was just speaking into the wind. No one was paying any attention to him at all. And then the flood came. And today, people eating, drinking, giving in marriage, mar you know, nothing wrong with those things. Nothing. It's just normal everyday activities, right? Except when they're all done with no acknowledgement of God at all. Complete indifference to God. And this rising atmosphere of secularism and atheism is astounding. Because there is a God in heaven. And I believe judgment has begun in the world and in this nation. But we're eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and I think the malls are packed and the stadiums are packed and people talking about what's happened on the latest sitcom and worried about all their entitlements and they have no idea they're living on an abyss and judgment is getting ready to fall.